Hi, everyone, and welcome to this event on behavioral science. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, my name is Chiara Barazzani, and I'm the lead behavioral scientist at DOECD. So today, I'm particularly thrilled to launch our latest report, which is called Logic, Good Practice Principles for Mainstreaming Behavioral Public Policy. So why did the DOECD uh, produce Logic? Well, many governments around the world uh, come to us for support to set up behavioral science functions in their government. And many of these governments uh, have a strong desire to learn from other countries. And since the UK government established the first behavioral insights unit in 2010, I think that we all learned a lot about what works and what doesn't in embedding behavioral science into public policies and government operations. And this is really what logic is about. So what kind of questions does logic help answer? Um, questions like how to set up a behavioral science function in government or what are the best governance models? But also how can you ensure that um, the impact and sustainability of a behavioral functions stays um, impactful over time? Now, with our time today, uh, we have the goal of sharing with you the key insights from the report and also uh, hear experiences from four experts representing different governments. Now, LOGIC is based on several years of rigorous research, combining data from governments around the world with also insights from behavioral science experts. And really this mix of evidence and experience has helped us identify the most effective principles for mainstreaming behavioral science in public policies. Now, importantly, we designed this principle to serve uh, both those who are just beginning their journey in using behavioral science, but also those looking to deepen and expand their existing impact. So uh, whether you are laying the groundwork or seeking to enhance your current practices, we really hope that logic will provide guidance to navigate and succeed in using behavioral science to design and implement better policies. Now, let's take a look at today's agenda. Uh, my colleague, Harris Khan and I will kick things off by introducing Logic. And then Kale Hubble, uh, our former OECD colleagues and really the mastermind behind Logic will moderate a panel discussion. Let me also say that today is Kale's uh, birthday. So we're particularly happy to have Kale with us who's joining from Australia where he's very late at the moment. Uh, and then we are honored to have uh, distinguished speakers from Finnish, Brazilian and the UK governments to share their insights. As the event unfolds, please feel free to add any questions you might have in the chat on Zoom. Now, let me start by situating logic within the broader context of our work. So the work we live at the OECD on behavioral science has three main missions. We convene, we enable and we advise. Um, and uh, so we convened a global network of behavioral science experts, enabling government to use behavioral science. And finally, we advise them on policy challenges, typically by generating new evidence with policy experiments. Now, the work on logic sits within the enable bucket that really aims at providing guidance and building capacity within government. So let's uh, look, take a look at the big picture here. So we counted more than 300 institutions around the world applying behavioral science to public policies. And I must say that the growth in recent years um, is occurring in two directions, both in terms of broadening. So there's a broader range of countries that are setting up behavioral science functions, but also in terms of deepening the practice. So many countries now have multiple teams and functions set up in various governments throughout the public administrations. So the, this board map is intended to convey the breadth of work happening all over the world. But of course, it's not exhaustive uh, because believe me, it's quite tricky to capture so many institutions on one single page. And of course, it won't stay up to date. So this is why we have uh, an online map um, in which this is um, up to date uh, with new institutions uh, every day. Now, as you can see in the graph on the left, uh, growth is accelerating with more than half of the new teams uh, being created since 2019. And so this is the continuation of an ongoing trend, uh, but of course it was likely accelerated by COVID-19, which was of course inherently a behavioral problem, especially at the beginning before we had vaccines. And also if you look at the, at the graph on the right, you can see that our data show that countries are operating now with very different governance arrangements. 
So you have both dedicated units uh, in center of government, but also specific functions in uh, different line agencies or more dispersed in expertise, or sometimes even just ad hoc expertise outside government. So as you can see, the, the models and the arrangements um, are vary a, a lot across governments. And given this speed and growth of change within our practice, at the OECD, we keep track of the growth and diversity of the practice with a mixed method approach. Uh, so we are serving governments in 2020, 2021, and then 2023. Um, and some of this research was done in partnership with Bear at the University of Toronto. We also do semi-structured interviews with senior practitioners. And we, of course, draw on our regular interactions with our network of behavioral science experts. And of course, our of course also the online knowledge hub, uh, where new teams can register themselves, and where we have a living map. So all this is really the basis of um, the data that we use to build logic. Now, despite this growth, we see that practitioners are facing a lot of challenges still, and there are a wide variety of challenges, but they are all in a way uh, related to institutional factors and the relationship behavioral science teams have to their organizations. So one might think that this gets easier as teams become more mature. However, what we saw is that the oldest, most mature team actually report more challenges. Um, and so maybe of course, this is linked to the fact that with time, they're likely to face differing situations and also uh, develop strategies to address them. So really the impetus of this report was to leverage the collective knowledge of the community, both from more experienced teams and new teams, to identify good practices that have been affecting, effective in mainstreaming behavioral public policy and overcoming these challenges, of course. So with this, I would like to leave the floor to my colleague, Harris, who is going to present the logic principles more uh, in depth. Harris, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chiara, and thanks for everyone on the call for joining today. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Before getting into the principles themselves, I'd like to talk about what we mean when we say behavioral public policy. Uh, behavioral science can help governments and policymakers analyze policy challenges, design effective solutions, and dedicate their limited resources to policies with the greatest chance of success. And recognizing the centrality of citizens and consumers' behavior to policy work, governments around the world are have increasingly augmented their policymaking practices with behavioral science insights and methods. And this approach is known as uh, behavioral public policy, and it's basically the use of behavioral science evidence to help inform policymaking. In front of you, we have a, a policy cycle, and um, I like to go through how behavioral science can help uh, in each of, these, each of these phases. When it comes to problem identification, behavioral science can help notice and prioritize societal challenges where people are acting in ways that are counter to their or society's long-term interests, such as making unhealthy food choices or not taking advantage of government programs available to them. Uh, behavioral science can also help analyze the problem and understand the drivers and barriers to a particular group's behavior within a societal system, which of course can help inform policy design and making sure that the uh, programs and policies that we do implement are addressing those barriers. And this is seen as a really large growth area in behavioral science over the last few years, where increasingly behavioral science evidence is being used to help the design of policy. When it comes to policy assessment, behavioral science has a set of tools that help uh, policymakers de-risk the implementation of policy through the use of randomized control trials, pilot testing, and other experimental methods. And of course, policy implementation is kind of the bread and butter, most traditional use of behavioral science, where behavioral science can help um, policymakers decide specifically how a policy should be implemented optimize a, pro a program that's already in place um, or maximize its impact and ensure that intended outcomes are being realized in practice. And then lastly, uh, behavioral science can also help uh, policymakers monitor their, their policy implementation actions and, and evaluate them to make sure that the next problem that's identified is, uh, is addressing you know, the, key, the key issues that are in place. Without further ado, on the next slide, We'll have um, the all the principles, all fourteen of them. You might be asking, you know, why why we named the uh, the framework logic? It's because we have broken them down into these five dimensions, as we as we like to call them. So the first is leadership, which refers to the role and relationship of leaders in an organization. Objectives is about the strategy um, and and how the goals of a behavioral science uh, function should be identified. Governance it refers to how behavioral science fits within the structure of an organization and 
the resources available to, um, to behavioral science uh, practitioners. Integration talks about what kinds of processes uh, we need to implement uh, and really professionalize the space, uh, ensuring that there is a demand for behavioral science expertise that's ongoing and sustainable. And then lastly, capability uh, refers to the kind of skills and experience governments as a whole need to mainstream behavioral science and how best to organize them. So this is the kind of over, overall view of, of the five dimensions, as well as the 14 principles that are um, included with them, them. And now I'm going to go into each of the each of the dimensions in a bit more detail. Starting with leadership, we know that the actions and words of influential leaders can be critical in encouraging the uptake of variable science. And when senior leaders in government advocate for a people-centered approach and request a uh, uh, robust evidence base, we see an increase in, in the use of behavioral science. Um, yeah, as, a, as a good example, uh, the US federal government has just recently released an executive order uh, on applying social and behavioral sciences to federal policies and programs that uh, I encourage everyone on the call to take a look at. It really does do this, this uh, explicit promotion of behavioral science as a tool for improving policy making. So good practice principle number one is a senior leaders request and advocate for behavioral science when relevant. And of course, um, it's, also it's also the responsibility of behavioral science managers and people who, who work in behavioral science to maintain senior leader support for behavioral science through um, regular briefings and making sure that they're engaged at all, at all levels. Moving on to objectives. Governments can uh, can include behavioral science in the strategic plans and monitor its use over time. This may include a formal definition of behavioral science um, and how it's related to this, related to the strategic goals of uh, of government. So here we have three good practice principles. Again, by defining strategic objectives, senior managers um, and leaders. Uh, can help government deliver its, its strategic objectives by showing where exactly behavioral science would be useful. Um, it's also important to monitor impact and make sure that uh, we are assessing behavioral science as a, as a tool to make sure that it's uh, achieving its goals. And a good example of this uh, comes from the Netherlands where every two years a report is made to parliament on the use of behavioral science, including case studies, um, really promoting the value of the tool and making sure that it's um, it's uh, being used in every way that's possible. That's 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 valuable. Uh, good practice principle number five uh, refers to the use of behavioral science in designing and improving internal organizational processes, rules, and incentives, uh, which is another growth area in behavioral science. We're seeing more and more countries turning inwards and using behavioral science on their own uh, policies or programs, which makes the whole public administration more effective and then allows for better policy delivery and program delivery across all areas. Quickly moving to, to governance, uh, we find that a clear accountability structure around, re, around how resources and activities are managed can help a government efficiently and effectively embed behavioral science into policy making procedures and practices. So this has a kind of a two sides of the coin approach. One good practice principle is that senior leaders clearly allocate the responsibility for mainstreaming behavioral science and establish lines of accountability. This can take the form of a single senior executive or a team being responsible for the mainstreaming of behavioral science across uh, a government or a public administration. Um, but if that accountability is established, naturally the, the kind of result of that is that that, uh, that uh, team should be resourced efficiently and that senior leaders and managers mobilize sufficient resources to ensure policy advice is informed by relevant and reliable behavioral science evidence. And this can take many forms. Uh, Kiara showed a graphic earlier with behavioral science expertise in different places in the public administration. And uh, these resources can be, can be placed you know, uh, across a wide variety of areas. Integration, uh, which is on the next slide, refers to creating an enabling environment for behavioral public policy such that uh, behavioral science evidence can be uh, embedded into processes and, and uh, is easy to, easier, easier to produce. Uh, so good practice principle number eight suggests that managers integrate behavioral science into standard guidelines and procedures for policy development, implementation, and evaluation. This, for example, can take the form of uh, creating templates with behavioral science is mentioned as a, as a part of the analysis process of a, of a policy proposal or a, or a program delivery proposal and making sure that there's space for that evidence to be included in the, in the discussion. 
a good practice principle number nine is, is crucially important. It's really important that managers of behavioral science students in this case ensure that behavioral science is applied responsibly, openly, and with high integrity standards to build and maintain policymakers and citizens' trust. Um, as it is unlikely that we'd be able to conduct this work if um, you know trust is lost from policymakers and citizens, and making sure that we're doing all that we can to uphold the highest levels of ethical and research standards in this space is a great way of um, maintaining that trust. Good practice, good practice principle number 10 uh, refers to creating a data infrastructure in which managers can support processes and structures for data collection and analysis that make it easier to diagnose behavioral issues and evaluate policy options. So this ties directly to the, to the policy cycle that I mentioned earlier. It allows for an easy identification of problems and the barriers that may be causing problems um, and making sure that it's easier and that it's, it's more seamless to evaluate policy options. A great example of this comes from Canada where uh, the behavioral science team in the Privy Council office conducts an ongoing program of research when it comes to climate change, helping to understand how Canadians um, feel and behave when it comes to, to uh, climate and climate related behaviors. And it allows for an ongoing ability to um, identify problems and then uh, assess policy options. Finally, we have capability, which refers to the um, the ability for the for the for a public administration to uh, produce and use behavioral science expertise. So, good practice principle number eleven uh, suggests that managers build policymakers' capabilities to apply behavioral science lens to their work. So that means that it shouldn't just be behavioral science units or behavioral science experts in governments who are able to uh, use behavioral science uh, in their work, but the, the literacy in the field should be built as broadly as possible, such that people can identify where behavioral science can be useful and apply it to their to their work whenever they they are able to. However, when they when you know uh, someone who's not an expert in behavioral science needs to needs to apply perhaps uh, more advanced behavioral science techniques, they should be able to access expertise. And uh, it's up to behavioral science units and, and managers who who operate them to develop sustainable ways for policymakers to access that expertise. Good practice principle number 13 refers to the brokerage of knowledge, which means that managers ensure that behavioral science evidence can be useful to inform policymaking processes through quality brokerage. Um, this basically refers to, you know, trying to make behavioral science uh, experts more advisors than simply researchers, uh, adding that advisory aspect to their work um, and can take the form of, of individuals in behavioral science units who are perhaps responsible for that brokerage fun function. They perhaps don't, they don't produce evidence um, on their own, but they're responsible for taking evidence that is produced and making sure that it's applied uh, to, to policy making processes whenever, whenever relevant. And then finally, number 14 is share knowledge uh, in which managers build mechanisms for dissemination and knowledge sharing, such as networks of behavioral science experts and supporters. I, uh, I'm sure that many of you here today uh, heard about this event through your own national or or, or, um, or perhaps international communities practice for behavioral science. And we find that this is a great way of ensuring that there is sustained buy-in and growth in the in the uh, community and uh, and continues to grow over over long periods of time. So finally, uh, I like to I like to show the the principles again. As you see, there, there are 14 of them. Um, and in the full report, which will, which will be available shortly, the, um, each, of these, each of these principles is uh, built out at great detail. There's also examples from countries of activities that are being done to, to uh, support each of these principles. There are um, more, more in-depth case studies of countries as they've gone through their maturity journeys in um, in applying these principles, and um, there's <coughs> sorry uh, questions a checklist of questions that can help governments uh, analyze analyze their own situations and ensure that they're being uh, that that these principles are in place and and uh, understand what needs to be done to to mainstream them further. Uh, so with that quick overview of the principles, um, I'd like to I'd like to turn it over to our our panelists. Um, as as uh, Kara mentioned, it's being it's being moderated by uh, the fantastic Kale, who is an acting senior advisor at Beta, which is the Australian government's central behavioral science unit. He brings a deep background in psychology and 
um, social science with 10 years experience in varying various evidence generation analysis roles in the public and not for profit sector in the Australia and the UK. And very importantly, he spent a few months with us here at the OECD last year where he was uh, incredibly influential in creating this report. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Kale and, uh, and I believe he'll introduce the, the, remaining, uh, the remaining panelists. Thank you, Harris, and thank you, Kiara, and thank you everyone for joining today. Um, really excited personally to see this report entering the world shortly, um, and really excited to have um, to have a number of people here to, to talk to talk to us all about their journey with behavioral science and and how they've been going in their countries with embedding behavioral science evidence into into their governments. Um, so yes, as Harris mentioned, three fantastic panelists. Um, here today, although we have just saw, saw in the chat that unfortunately Kladic, um is unable to speak, so we have substituted in a fantastic um, colleague of his, Maris Arakamoas, um, who I'll, I'll speak to in just a moment. But uh, our other panelists are uh, Dr. Marit Lassander, um, who is the lead senior specialist in the Finnish behavioral policy team, um, a role that she's been in since 2021, and that team is based in the Prime Minister's office. Marit holds a PhD in psychology and a master's degree in political science. She's previously worked in the healthcare sector and in NGOs and has been a visiting fellow at Yale and the London School of Economics. We have Dr. Rupert Gill, uh, who's uh, currently built the behavioral science team at Ofcom, which is the media regulator at the, in the United Kingdom. Uh, and the role of that team at the moment is kind of helping the organization to set up regulation around social media platforms to combat online harm. Uh, Rupert has a master's in political theory and a PhD in moral psychology and economic philosophy. Uh, before his work at Ofcom, he led the behavioral insights team at His Majesty's, is it His Majesty's now, I suppose, Rupert, um, Revenue and Customs, um, which was at the time the largest in-house behavioral science team in the UK government. Uh, and prior to that, he applied the science of motivation to design early interventions in job centers for people with health conditions. Um, and now, Marizaura Kamoas, I'm sorry, I don't have a bio handy for you. I'm sorry, because this was a last minute um, substitution. Um, but she works uh, in as a coordinator of CINCO, um, the behavioral science unit uh, in the Ministry of Management and Innovation uh, in public services uh, in Brazil. Um, so fantastic to have our three wonderful panelists with us today. Um, so just to kind of situate the conversation that I'd like to have with everyone today, um, as Harris was saying, uh, we, we think about the mainstreaming of behavioral public policy as being a process. Um, it's a journey that a government or an organization goes through from starting out in considering behavioral science evidence um, to slowly over time considering it perhaps wherever it is relevant. And there's changes all the way along that process in terms of leadership changes, changes of strategies or mandates, changes in the way that the, organ the organization of resources or funds, this kind of function. And this kind of process we, uh, we, we touch on in the, in the OECD report, um, but it's something that I think kind of deserves further unpacking. Um, so that's kind of what I'd like, to, like us to focus on in, in the chat today. So Marit, uh, Marit, all right, start with you. Um, if we're thinking about the journey that uh, the Finnish government has gone on so far in terms of taking behavioral science uh, into embedding it into the way that the Finnish government does policy making, was there one event or change that kind of represented a turning point? And maybe you can talk to the significance of that in Finland. Um, uh, I hope you can hear me well. Um... I think there has been actually quite many turning points in our journey. Um, our journey began really already in 2013 when we had this uh, collaboration between governments uh, for the Governments for Future, which also had a report then done. And uh, afterwards, we had had um, experimentation culture for four years, uh, which was government led and um, quite a intensive uh, sort of period for experimentation. And there was a huge uh, interest in that really. And I'm sure that many of you have already heard of the Finnish uh, basic income um, uh, experiment, which was uh, uh, very well uh, uh, sort of reported in the media in 2017. I was also involved in that. And uh, 
I, I think it doesn't come as a surprise that after all that in 2020, when we uh, were in the middle of COVID crisis, that um, we sort of uh, started to benchmark and uh, look out uh, solutions that other countries were doing around Europe and also elsewhere. And we, we saw that, okay, behavioral sciences in, is being widely used. Uh, there are many good ex examples. There are many groups we, being formed, um, sort of like advisory bodies. And we thought, that, okay, we, we definitely, we have to experiment on that as well. And there was a pilot that uh, uh, began in 2020, October, and it lasted six months. Um, uh, there was an end report. Um, it was quite well received, I think, in the government. Uh, especially in the communications, because it was uh, basically advising the communications team, and um, and they they felt it was a it was a great help at that time, when uh, nobody really knew how to sort of be, uh, get people to wear masks and get the vaccinations and uh, what kind of communications we should use. So basically, um, after that, um, in twenty one, when I came aboard. Um, we started to um, continue the project, uh, of course, and to sort of uh, widen the uh, uh, sort of the projects in the central government, in different ministries, in different subject areas. And uh, if I really had to give a key turning point, I would say it was like uh, the end of uh, 21, uh, when we had uh, two people working in this team and uh, we're working in the prime minister's office. And uh, we realized that we, we can do quite many things with two people already. And, uh, and of course there was uh, also like a sort of increasing interest in that uh, growing network, so to say. So I think when people saw that we can do quite many things, we did, for example, like text messages for, um, uh, for young people to encourage uh, voting. And that was like um, RCT that was uh, widely reported in media uh, twice because we did in two elections and hopefully we'll do it more and scale up. But I think that was one of the turning points as well. Yeah, fantastic. And what did that, like, sort of what did the successful, those trials mean for for the way that you, that you do your work, Mara? Has, has it led to... I don't know, a bigger team, more projects? Has it allowed you to work in different areas? It has allowed us to work in um, every imaginable area, I think. <laughs> the scale of our work is, is it's just amazing. And uh, uh, we try to keep up. It's sometimes quite difficult. Um, but uh, we have a team of four people now. We are going to be five uh, in September. Uh, we have an EU project coming up, and um, I, I think uh, the scale is sort of growing steadily. Of course, it, uh, with the resources, it's never easy. This is not an easy time in general to uh, do this kind of work, but uh, I, I think we are persisting. <laughs> Thank you, Vera. Is there anything um, I'm interested about, kind of what is it about the context that has enabled you to grow at the moment? Um, especially, as you say, given given the pressures that a lot of countries are under at the moment, is there any factors kind of around the team that that's a, that's kind of supporting your growth or that that's enabling you to be successful? I I think uh, we have had the luck uh, of uh, growing a really really good team. Um, also, we had good support from the PMO from the strategic uh, department uh, all the way. And um, I would also say that um, I, I think that we can't afford not to use behavioral sciences at the moment. So I think that's the message, what we are trying to sort of convey that um, this is something that we really need to do if we want to have impact in several areas. And uh, I would say that um, we have tried to be um, ambitious about what we want to achieve but also humble about what we know and uh, sort of um, not going into advising people, but working together to achieve something that seems very complex, seems very, very hard to sort of tackle. And in general, I think that people and teams uh, working for the government are really happy to have that kind of support uh, when we are working with very complex and difficult issues. Thank you, Merit. Being ambitious but humble 
is difficult, I think. I find that very hard personally. How do you, how do we, we have to sell ourselves sometimes, but also sell the limitations? Yeah, it's difficult. Anyway, thank you, Marit. Um, Rupert, maybe I can turn to you, be keen to hear from you about um, any particular turning points perhaps in, in, in Ofcom uh, or, and if you feel able to speak more broadly to the UK government and the experience of the UK government more broadly with behavioral science. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks for having me. It's, um, it's lovely to be here. Uh, actually, before I go into that, I would just like to say I really like I really like the report and the framework. Um, I know I have to say that, but it's, it happens to be true. I was like, a, one thing I find being a sort of leading Babel Insight teams is it can be a bit lonely, right? I think it's, it's quite unique what you're doing and it's a bit, uh, you sometimes feel a bit isolated. It's quite, there aren't that many people in the same circumstances who can give you really good advice. Um, and when I read the, the framework, it was, um, it's going to sound a bit strange, but it was, it made me think of the Fuji song, Killing Me Softly with his song. You're looking nervous, Carol. But don't worry. <laughs> so, uh, and the reason is because there's a line in there, which is, uh, I felt, I felt he read my letters. He found my letters and read each one out loud. And I felt like, oh. like these like secret thoughts from my head and these insights that I felt like I picked up and other people didn't know about. <laughs> and there they are, written down in this framework. Uh, so look, I, I did. I mean, I did Google your name, Rupert, before this, just to, you know, check out who, who is this Rupert person I've never met. And I saw some comments you'd made at a previous conference about this topic. And I was heartened that you'd said similar things to, <laughs> to what we said in the report. I think it's, no, I mean, genu genuinely, I think it's really useful. I think you're bang on. I think you've really got the, the key components. And I would really encourage anyone to, like the checklist format, I think is it's a really great asset. So, um yeah, that's that's point number one. So turning to your actual question about about turning points, um, I think I might I might turn to my, my former role, which was heading up the, the UK tax the not didn't head up the tax authority, the behavioural team within the tax authority. Um, so a lot of people know that you know the very first behavioural insight team, the nudge unit, their first trial with is was in HMRC. Uh, that's the nine out of ten people in your area have, have paid their tax on time um, trial. That was obviously a really important point that quantified uh, an impact, um, but it's worth remembering that there were lots of things in favor of the team at the time, right? So the, there was huge like uh, political support. So you know, the prime minister at the time, the deputy prime minister, the head of the civil service, the head of the tax authority, they were all keen on trying to see what can we do with behavioral insight in the, you know, the aftermath of the financial crisis. Uh, so you had this huge backing and to be fair to the, the nudge unit, they were really great at taking that opportunity and establishing um, that Babel Insight can make an impact. I think the interesting turning point almost is when things change, right? So the lovely thing about political sport is it gives you a bit of clout, it opens doors, but it's it's time limited, right? People change, they move jobs, or new priorities come up, uh, and you're always a little bit vulnerable if you, you know if you're depending on a, on a on a senior backer and they they disappear. What do you do next? Um, and I think the evolution of the team in HMRC is really interesting because instead of uh, and this is kind of a lesson that I think is kind of interesting for this one. So you're talking about how do you mainstream labor public policy? My answer is if, if you don't have big, like senior backing, avoid the mainstream, don't go into the mainstream, right? It's, but I, my experience is it's very hard to have a really strong voice. People are really interested. They really like you kind of broadening out the different uh, yeah, social aspects or the environmental factors that might be driving behavior. But it's really hard to get enough traction to fight against the status quo. Like organizations revert back into their normal ways of doing it, their normal ways of thinking. It's hard to fight, swim against that type. So for us, actually, we found a lot of success in finding not the mainstream, actually, sometimes the, the side stream, the, the little kind of channel down the side where we found sort of areas where there's quite a lot of autonomy. So, you know, it's particular areas of the organization, maybe a bit siloed, right? normally anti silos, but if you find a silo, where they've got a bit more autonomy, it means you have a louder voice. And if you can find a few combinations there, so you can find a few senior people within that area who kind of like behavioral science or interested, they're innovators. You can find, um, ideally, they've got some data, they've got um, some ability to kind of act, measure, learn. We found that particularly in debt management. So in the tax authority, debt is a really big deal, it's a huge amount of money. For some reason, it's kind of hived off, it's a little bit separate to the mainstream in, in uh, in HMRC, and we were able to like build this sort of great relationships where we sort of train up the more junior staff. We had the backers and the seniors, and then we could do like a series of trials over kind of year after year, um, on the, sometimes on the same tax behavior, and it enabled to build from like an initial couple of trials into actually detecting behavior is really complicated, right? So sometimes people are you're thinking about sometimes people are tactical, they're deliberately in debt, 
right? And you've got to try and make them, they're waiting for, to, to see if you're really serious. You've got to try and work out how to get them to pay. But you've also got to worry about the guys who are really vulnerable and need support and how do you get them to kind of not put their head in the sand. So you start getting into quite complicated behaviors. And we were able to do a whole series of trials there uh, and build this really great sort of um, program of work, uh, which I think is fantastic. I will just point to a second turning point, actually, which I think is kind of interesting too. So when the pandemic struck uh, and in the tax authority, they're looking at the what we call the furlough scheme. Uh, so that's uh, when government stepped in and basically paid the wages for private, uh, private sector employees and said, look, we'll, we'll subsidize, we'll pay the wages of your staff uh, so you don't have to lay them off. Um, we're able to have a really big impact on that, that scheme. Uh, in my experience, it's the most kind of thoroughgoing widespread input of behavioral thinking into a policy I've come across and I've certainly worked on. So that was things like actually even the very basic framing of, of what, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to provide, provide financial support or actually you doing something a bit more psychologically subtle? You're trying to provide reassurance, try to stop people panicking, panicking, providing a bit of certainty in the economy. Uh, so even that framing is really, we were able to influence that and that's really important because it opens the door to be very human centric, right? So we've got to think about these businesses, what are they going through? Um, you know, and actually the COVID, you remember you're checking your phone all the time. What's the latest stats? Like what the government's saying. If you're also trying to run a business and you've no idea when you're going to be able to do business, let alone what you do about your employees, there's a lot of stress. So we were able to say, look, we need to build this service very human-centered way. And we were writing the guidance. How do people process information under stress? How do they read things? What are they going to understand? Uh, the user interface, even some of the anti-fraud measures. So really thorough behavioral input, which is fantastic. And I was reflecting on like what, why it's kind of your question earlier, actually, what were the factors that enabled us to do that? I was that about of, to ask you, Rupert. Yeah, yep. what, what made the difference, <laughs> right? And I, I would say, I, I think there are probably four things that I think probably have lessons for other circumstances, right? One is, uh, is novelty, right? It's a new scheme. So there's no like established norms of doing it and no one, we hadn't, the government had never done anything for like that. And that opens the door for new ideas uh, and it means you're less treading on someone's territory. There's less status quo to fight against. As I said earlier, I think that status quo is you're often fighting as a behavioral scientist. You're often fighting against status quo. There really wasn't one, right? So there's a lot of openness. That makes a huge difference. A second thing, actually, I think is the track record, right? So because the team had been around for a while and we'd demonstrate our, our credibility, we'd done the trials, we worked in different areas in the department. It meant that people trusted us and we were able to, and we knew people as well. You know, we had, you had that kind of good relationships with senior people in the organization. I think if the, if the pandemic had come at the beginning of the team, I don't think we would have been able to sit at the top table and sort of be there when they're talking about, do we go live or not? I think that track record made a, made a big difference. And the third thing I would say is probably that, um, I'll say, I'm going to go four actually. The third thing is actually, we got a nice, um, the kind of really senior buy-in was good. So Rishi Sunak actually at the time was the chancellor. He was in charge of the scheme. Uh, he's now the prime minister. He was very behaviorally astute. So he really understands that, you know, if you're paying out things to the government, it's not just transferring money. You're also changing people's perception, how they feel, how they feel about the market. So that really helped his special advisors coming from the very top. There was an openness to consider behavioral uh, perspectives. So that made a big difference. And the final one I would say is I do think behavioral teams have to work quite hard and be, you know, there's quite a lot of burden on you to take opportunities, right? They wouldn't, we weren't really kind of invited in. They didn't like a, the crisis meeting, what you were going to do. We weren't the first people on the list. We managed to get in there because, you know, we're a team who are quite opportunistic. Uh, we knew the organization well. I think that's really important, not just knowing lots of behavioral stuff, but knowing the organization. And we had some very proactive, uh, very good communicators within the team, which meant we're able to, open some doors to start feeding in and able to communicate really well so people can see the value we're adding. Those all sound obvious things, right? But I haven't, teams fluctuate in their kind of where, where they are on that kind of, can you, when an opportunity comes out, are you able to take it? And new teams, old teams, more experienced teams. We had a sweet spot where we had a bunch of experienced people who could produce, you know, we could work really hard and can we simplify and communicate what we're saying really easily in that moment of like, everyone's in a panic. Can we make things easy for them? Can we make it feel easy, what we're saying, easy to take on board and not risky? So I think those things all came together to mean that we had this quite, this quite wide impact. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Rupert. We could talk about this for a long time. I, I have lots of questions around, I mean, it's, you know, having relationships and having the people there at the time who have, have the right approach 
all of that sounds fantastic and it just makes me think if you happen to lose those people or if you happen to you know if, if things change you know how do we kind of institute these things a little bit more kind of like into the whatever the wiring wasn't that the term Michael Hallsworth used you know how do we kind of bake these things in a little bit more but anyway I, I'm going to let Marizara uh, speak we'll move we'll move to Marizara if you don't mind um, Marizara keen to hear your uh, your reflections on um, one or two key turning points in Brazil um, for how uh, the, the journey of behavioral science and, and the way that it's being mainstreamed over time. Thank you, Kale. Uh, I'm sorry because Clara can, cannot be here. And I'm sorry because I'm not a, a totally fluent speaker, English speaker. So I will talk, try to talk Take a, your time. slowly. Okay. Of course. <laughs> uh, you can speak in Portuguese, but I, I, I'm totally sure you will not understand. Um, I, I think the Brazilian journal with behavior science did have a big bang. It began uh, as isolated experiences, then uh, some initiatives on Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo that are cities in Brazil. At the federal level, we start with the National School of Public Administration because since uh, 2017, uh, launching the regular behavior science course, Claire was the teacher of most of them, and some publishes about uh, behavior science, and Claire developed a method called the Simplismant, that is a uh, acronym, in order to, to improve insights and ideas for using behavioral science in, to help uh, public policies in general. These initiatives, the NAPS initiative was very important to create our awareness and critical mass at the federal administration. People start to know about it, uh, what we can do with uh, behavior insights. But I, I think the turning point uh, occurred in 2023, last year, with the inception of uh, CINCO, that is uh, the first behavioral science unit established in a new ministry focused on management and innovation and public service. I think it, it's an a important turning point, not only to Brazil, but to Latin America as well, because we can work together and see our contest and culture. Um, this developed provides uh, a lot of possibilities um, because our ministry is responsible for transversal pol policies, uh, entire public administration in Brazil, like procurement, human resources, digital services, technical support. And our mission as ministry is improve public policy and the public society's life. So we are totally connected with our mission. And this change in government, uh, at the beginning of last year, marked by Lula's inauguration and the establishment of a new government structure. This ministry is uh, the first innovation ministry in public services in Brazil. Uh, we, I did some advocacy with some people because of my experience at ANAP and uh, I was the coordinator of Genova, that it was the innovation lab here in Brazil. And we use in a lot of projects, behavior insights. So I did some advocacy, let's, we have to, to have a behavior insight unit here. Uh, so uh, we, I, I received this invitation to start this new area. And I invited Claré, of course. He is the main reference in Brazil, the using behavior insights in public policy, teacher and publications. So we, we, we had a, a, a grant the special power to recruit civil servants uh, from different branches in Brazil. So uh, it gave us a, an opportunity to recruit staff all of our team that today it's 15 uh, full-time people and one part-time person, uh, all civil servants in Brazil that belongs for different uh, uh, 
public organizations, federal universities, regulatory agencies, general control is offers. So we have different uh, backgrounds in our team now. So, but I, I think this diversity is truly important to, to run our projects that involve research projects, of course, but as well communication, partnership, and do not for public policies, for policymakers, but with policymakers. For us, it's very important to develop projects and solutions using behavior insights uh, together because we, we cannot be a consultant uh, that put the, the solution on the table and please use this. We, we are trying to, to develop a sense of belong to do together. The projects that belong to us, you as policymaker and us as responsible for methodologies and a different knowledge, not so user in the federal government in Brazil. Thank you, Marazawa. I know we... if it, I, I, I was clear, I, I was no. using some notes here. <laughs> Sorry. No, I understood. Thank you. We we debate the use of the word consultant all the time in my team in Australia as well. <laughs> um, so Marazara, it sounds like your advocacy was really important and the, the change in the organizational structures in Brazil. Is there anything else that meant that uh, kind of like, why was it successful? Why, why were you able to kind of create Cinco at this at this moment? I I think the innovation movement in Brazil it's very strong, and uh, it's, I I work it with innovation and uh, employee engagement. My PhD was about uh, employee engagement in with civil servants. And I'm truly sure that solve public problems and help the society. It's truly engagement for the Brazilian civil servants. So work with behavior insights is look for people and people necessities and why they wanna do what they wanna behavior in order to, to help their lives. And it's so engagement. I, I'm truly confident that it's a, a, a huge success for us. Uh, I received more than 80 curriculums in order to be part of this initiative. It was impressive. Of course, Brazil, we have uh, millions of people, but uh, I think it's demonstrated uh, how many civil servants, federal civil servants in Brazil would like to work with that and believe the capacity of use these new lands of the behavioral insights in, in, to, to, to improve the society lives. And we have huge problems that we are trying to address with traditional ways. For example, we have a huge problem in Latin America, but in Brazil, it's truly great diseases uh, by transmitted by mosquitoes, for example like dengue, chikungunya, zika virus. And in this year, we had a, a lot of deaths because of that. And we, in Brazil, are invested millions in campaigns uh, for 30 years trying to solve this problem. And the problem is totally a uh, behavior of the society because if everybody clean water in their houses, the, the mosquito cannot uh, reproduce. But the, the traditional campaigns do not work. And we had a network and some people from the Minister of Health heard about us and read uh, a information, uh, a newsletter, a month newsletter that we are running and said, wow, we can use it in order to, to avoid the, the mosquitoes, for example. Mm. And we participate of the draw of the new plan for communication in order to finish or try to, 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 to deal with the mosquito transmission diseases in Brazil. That's millions and of people. And they have a lot of databases. They have a lot of what don't work and what works and the behavior can be a huge improvement in this politics, for example. 
and uh, I I think uh, it's uh, for old problems that the traditional ways cannot solve anymore. We mm. we appear as a, a, a poss an innovation possibility. Of course, we have to test, run experiments, uh, everything. Of course, we are a science area, but I think we we a point for a new possibilities. Amazing. Thank you, Marazara. Um, as expected, perhaps running out of time already, I'll go around uh, the three of you again um, and ask uh, what's something that you've learned over the last uh, few years that you wish you knew when you started out? All right. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think uh, we were sort of expecting to uh, get into the work right away. Uh, but what we discovered is that building behavioral sciences into government work takes a lot of time. It takes uh, more resources than we expected. Um, and there are really no short shortcuts <laughs> that you really have to do the work. And uh, you can't just like learn from maybe uh, more successful countries or something like that, but you really have to do that in your own country, in your own context and in your own environment, uh, because everywhere it's different and uh, the systems are different and you really have to um, uh, get to know them uh, preferably uh, work from inside because then you can really know uh, uh, what works, like what kind of processes uh, are useful and uh, what are the key moments when you need to have the behavioral science at hand and uh, when it's already too late. So, so I think we really have to be very close and, uh, and sort of like observant uh, all time about that. And um, I would also say that we, I was surprised about the uh, role of the communications, how large it is really in the beginning, uh, that, um, of course, support from the wider government enables like uh, wider opportunities and more work. But you really need to like sort of uh, to let people know who you are, what you do, with whom you are doing these things, and uh, to build trust. And uh, if, you, if you don't have like working communications procedures and, uh, and, and really like things that you tell people, uh, regularly, like we we try to have like regular coffee mornings. We try to have like uh, researchers coming uh, to present uh, things from their work. We try to have like um, a sort of a, like popularized uh, research report a um, few times a year, uh, just to communicate to people that we are here, we are doing things, and uh, they can be part of this. I, I really uh, appreciate what Marisa was saying that um, it's really about doing things together. Um, there are plenty of consultants who can can of course participate, but um, if you have the opportunity to work from inside and uh, sort of uh, involve the teams, involve the civil servants in the work, it can be. I think that is transforming. Not only that you sort of like uh, provide solutions and. Uh, uh, consult and uh, give uh, research reports, but um, that you really show people now uh, what they can do differently, and uh, that that needs, of course, time and uh, effort to let to sort of let people into the process. Thank you, Merit. Completely agree, Rupert. Very quickly, one or one or two things that you wish you'd uh, you'd known at the earlier in the journey of your, of embedding behavioral science in HMRC or perhaps at Ofcom. Oh, you might be on mute, I think, still, Rupert. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I would, I would definitely agree that you have to keep maintaining the message. I think people don't really understand what behavioral science is and they don't really know what they, it can do for them, like what the benefit is. So you have to keep making that case repeatedly. People are always interested, but they don't know how to use you very effectively. Um, that means you have to be the advocate. Um, I think in terms of mistakes, yeah, one big one I think for me was um, you've got to answer subtlety, right? How subtle can you be? So I think often a lot of uh, behavioral science can be uh, very subtle, right? You're, you're trying to kind of really read into a human behavior, design something that really fits around humans in a certain context. Government organizations are not great at subtlety, right? They're, for, for good reasons. Often they have to do kind of one size fits all or, you know, a few small variations. Um, I've definitely developed projects in the past where we kind of developed interventions that are really carefully designed and 
fit very carefully around the humans that we're dealing with. Um, but then they go into the kind of the machine of, well, we've got to train hundreds of frontline staff to be able to do this intervention. And then, you know, we need the trainers to understand it. And, you know, they're kind of, once you start getting into kind of taking things into this big scale, I guess this is the scalability problem. It's very hard to maintain that subtlety. You know, you lose a lot of the kind of the insight, the delicate stuff you designed will get sort of pushed out the side, unless you're there to be a continual advocate all the way through, which is quite sometimes a multi-year challenge. So I think that kind of, can you get something that adds a lot of behavioral kind of insight, but doesn't go too far into sort of perfecting because government, most government, this is not always a true, but a lot of government systems aren't really designed for that kind of, that kind of fine tuning. So that was definitely a bit of a, a painful lesson for me along the line. Thank you, Rupert. And Maria Zara, any lessons learned over your years of working on behavioral science in Brazil? Uh, I think we, we start to, after um, most of you, and we are learning a lot with uh, our experiences, the, the, the right things and the, the, the mistakes, of course. But I, I think one great lesson uh, we have to, to learn with uh, people that have more experience than us, for example, participating on the anti Ludd Academy was amazing. We learned a lot because in theory, it's one thing when we are running a project with, uh, uh, po with policymakers, there are a lot of not known technical issues that we have to deal with, uh, political issues and uh, political characteristics of our country that we are living now, we have to deal with. I I think uh, working with people who has experience in running projects and it's very important and we are learning a lot of uh, with it. And uh, uh, we are we don't have budget uh, yet. We have a lot of wonderful people working in, but so we have to work together. I think it's truly really important as well. How can we build the uh, bridges and work together and do the different expertise? And it's amazing how people want to work together in order to, to improve. Mm -hmm. I, I truly believe in that. Thank you, Marazara. And Kiara is keen to wrap up. So I'll pass to you. Now, thank you so much, Kale, for this beautiful panel. And thank you so much, Marit, Claret, and Marizara for jumping in, and, and Rupert for really precious insights here. And we just wanted to, uh, to give you a sense of um, you know, how you can use this tool uh, potentially to analyze the capacity of applied behavioral science and provide evidence-based recommendations. So just one thing that we wanted to share, um, is that one of the OECD core activities is really doing country reviews. And so we do these on all sorts of things. So the example that we show here is a review on public governance on plenty of different aspects like public integrity, evaluation practices, financial sustainability, and plenty of other things. And this kind of reports include comparison across countries and tailored advice drawing on best practices. Now that, um, while we, we have logic, we are now able to do something similar for how a country organizes and manages its use of behavioral science to improve policies, services, and its own internal administration. So if you can imagine a review, um, it will really help countries understand how they compare to global benchmarks of best practices. And based on this, of course, they can receive um, very practical uh, advice on, on improve on different things. So, of course, uh, a review can help a country set up a new behavioral science function, but also transform a function into a new and a more effective model, for example, or provide ideas on how to further refine or innovate an established uh, function. And to do a review of like this, we will, of course, use the principles that Harris uh, presented that really has been agreed, have been agreed with the global community. And just to give you an example, we could follow logic to go over one specific dimension at the time. So for example, we can assess maturity for leadership. And so we had a set of uh, metrics and questions. So for example, we'll go and look at how do public servants talk about behavioral science publicly and internally. Equally, you can look at the objectives part. You can have a look at how good they're doing on monetary impact. 
So you can ask how behavioral science activities and their impacts are monitored over time. In equal in other dimensions, you can look at the integration part. Uh, so asking, for example, how is behavioral science incorporating into standard policy making procedures and guidelines? And you might be amazed that some countries might be really good at the leadership part, but might, they might there might be still room of improvement on the integration part, for example. So we really see this as a diagnostic tool uh, to help governments around the world do better. Um, and with this, I uh, just wanted to encourage you all to have a look at the highlight document that you can download using the QR code here. And also really encourage you to uh, all to think about how these principles might be applied with your own context. We really hope to use these as an opportunity to advance the integration of behavioral science in public policy globally. So I would really like to thank everyone for tuning in today and for uh, your insights, especially to the panelists. And on behalf of the OECD, we look forward to seeing you again at future events in the behavioral science space. Thank you so much and see you soon.